This week's video is on happiness, and I have a different take on happiness. Because I have it that happiness wears different masks. There are those who constantly grumble about everything, and then there are those who keep their struggles to themselves, saying very little. You'll find those who overdo it with an always upbeat front, while others don't even bother to pretend, trudging through their days like they're just going through the motions. But here's the kicker. Many people who are really down in the dumps don't even recognize their own unhappiness. It's become their standard operating mode, so much so that for them it kind of feels normal. Yet it's precisely these patterns of behavior that can be telltale signs of a deeper disconnect which is lurking beneath the surface. So for too many years now, finding happiness has become an invisible endeavor for many. And the ironic thing is that in chasing happiness, people are becoming more and more unhappy. So why is this? Now, I have it uh, because the pursuit of happiness often leads these people to fixate on external measures and superficial sources of joy. This external focus, whether in the form of uh, mental or not mental, material possessions, uh, comparison with others, or uh, impulsive distractions, what it does is tend to be fleeting and does not contribute to lasting fulfillment. It's fulfillment that we want to try to chase. Now, don't be confused with me saying that happiness does not exist, because of course it does. We find happiness in simple things like a sunrise, a sunset, or a baby laughing. Uh, finding a hundred dollars which you stashed in one of your old jacket pockets many years ago. So my point here is that this happiness is found in the simple things. If you're out there living in society, navigating through its difficulties, uh, the breakdowns and the interruptions which come when you're participating in life, in your job, in your business, in your family, or, or almost every other facet where shit is going to happen, well, you know what? It's part of life. Happiness as a fuel simply is not enough. So learning to embrace all these crappy experiences and learning from them will put a person way above the simpleness of happiness. So if the shallowness of happiness is the simple goal for you, let me exaggeratingly, don't like that word, be radical for a moment. Because I have it that to really attain this happiness, this simpleness, you have to leave society. Go and uh, leave people and live isolated from anything which could offer you the experience of the opposite. So you don't have to really learn to deal with it and you can stay happy and simple. So I believe there's a common misconception that happiness exists in the absence of other emotions. So creating an unrealistic standard of perpetual positivity, leading people to ignore and suppress things like sadness, regret, pain, all of these things, because each feeling, whether positive or challenging, what it does is contribute to a deeper understanding of oneself and the richness of this human experience we're living. It's important to recognize that happiness is just one part, and by allowing ourselves to feel and navigate the array of all these other emotions, we gain a more authentic and complete sense of fulfillment. So it's not about avoiding discomfort, but learning from it and appreciating the diversity of emotions which make our lives more meaningful and more fulfilling. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to outline seven common behaviors which I've seen in unhappy people. I could give you 700, 7,000, but I'm making these videos too long and I want to keep it short. So what I'm going to do after that is then offer what the opposite looks like, really simple. And then I'm going to give a brief strategy for making the transition to a more fulfilling and content state. So let's get into it. Number one, we have jealousy-driven criticism. Ah, so this is one for the resentful people out there. The ones who see a beautiful luxury car drive past and say something like, must be good to have daddy's money, or must be compensating for a small ding -a -ling. Or the one which I've heard way too many times, what a rich wack. So envy and jealousy are simply a reflection of the insecurity of the person. And too many people are quick to criticize and judge rather than be curious and inquisitive. 
because it's here where the gossipers live. And I often say that gossip is the currency of the poor. So what's the opposite look like of jealousy-driven criticism? The opposite to this is uh, to be inspired by others' success and focus on personal growth. Simple, yeah? Transition, how can you do this? Imagine going up to this person driving the car and saying, you know what, mate? That's a really cool car. If you could offer three pieces of advice or tell me three of your biggest learnings in life, what would they be? And you know what? It takes a combination of humbleness and courage to do this. How do I know? Because I've done it dozens of times. What a jealous person doesn't realize is that a person who has become successful wants other people to be successful. They love sharing their stories and their advice and and their time to those who are genuinely interested. So transform, transform envy into motivation and inquire to acquire. Admire the success of others and use it as your own inspiration to pursue your own goals. Because by learning to learn from others and making personal development a habit and having aligned goals, it's going to, to replace envy and turn this resentment into a clean fuel to propel you into a different way of interpreting things. Let's go to number two. Number two is the cycle of overcompensation or overexertion. Too many times I've seen a person trying too hard. Heck, I've even been that person myself. What happens is they're going to try and then they're going to try and then they're going to try and then sometimes they're going to get a great result, you know, this shot of happiness. Yet measure their overall efforts based on the compounded perceived failures and inadequacies. And often, you know what happens? It's the motivation gets lost and then they can become passive and resigned and then struggle to climb out of this passivity. Then in a motivated burst of energy, they all of a sudden take on too much at once. Maybe have a few wins amongst the frustrations. They end up resigned again. Do nothing until the next bout of motivation comes along. So what's the opposite of this one look like? Of overcompensation. Continual progress. So actively engaging in life and taking initiative, basically and simply, just step things out. And the transition could be as simple as setting small, achievable and realistic goals, because doing this creates motivation and can gradually build this sense of accomplishment and personal agency. So it increases your capacity so that when something doesn't go your way, you don't fall into this trench of despair. You accept that, dust yourself off, and with an embodied resilience, you readjust and then keep going. Number three, avoidance as coping. I'm sure we've all come across somebody who likes to avoid as a way of coping. I can't count how many times I've dealt with a friend or a client and things are going great. They're so happy. Then out of nowhere, All communication just stops and they can't be reached. When we do reconnect, they communicate how life just became too much and they needed to hide. They came across a few obstacles, forgot about the progress they were making and just disappeared into a hole. When turning to escapism, often as a form of therapy, people will turn to things like alcohol, substances, prescription medicine, or even a tub of ice cream. Many things to avoid facing what has just happened and just willing it to go away. It's generally driven from anxiety and a fear that the world is dangerous. Dangerous, so I have to hide until things get better. And something I've learned more and more over the years is that the more you avoid, the more the thing which you're avoiding lives in your head and makes you suffer. So, learn how you can learn to deal with it. What's the opposite look like? Simple, confronting problems head on and seeking healthy coping mechanisms. The transition for this, adopt a mood of wonder and be curious about what happened and why it makes you withdraw the way it does. Learning how they are as a learner or you are as a learner and then engage in activities that can get you out and into the world. For some, therapy can be Uh, Well, it can be a great help in facing issues directly because it's difficult to process deep-seated concerns and issues alone with the same thinking that has got the person seeing the situation as an issue. And in ontological coaching, this is what we do a lot with people. Number four, where are we on number four? We're expressing through size. 
So you've heard those people, the ones who carry an invisible, heavy burden in their communication. Ah, ah, eh, slumped, downtrodden. They're almost always happy, but yet never quite there. But still talk about it being the simple achievement which they want. They long for it. They are either very vague with what they're feeling or share way too much in a very confusing and ambiguous way because they're analysing each and every feeling, trying to make a distinct sense of them. Sighing is an expression of resignation and add a grumble mm, or a light growl uh, and it hints towards frustration. So what's the opposite look like for these people? Well, these people, they, they express their feelings openly and constructively and then learn that they are not their feelings, just simply experiencing them. And the transition of this, well, firstly, just be grateful. Start looking at all the great things you have, the people you, you do have in your life, your ability to know that you do have feelings and you can feel them and you can express them. But he's acknowledging the good in life, even in small doses, it, it, it shifts the perspective. So developing emotional awareness and communication skills, these things can help in expressing feelings more effectively. So actually take the time to identify the true feeling and get clear on it. Because once clear on it, it becomes easier to identify the reason you are feeling it. Number five, social withdrawal. Okay. Now, this one's similar to point number two. However, the difference is they are not running away from anything. They are simply withdrawing. So it's not done from anxiety, but more resignation. We hear things like, you know, why bother? It's not going to be fun in any way. Well, it's not going to be fun anyway. Yeah, it's not going to make a difference if I go or not. Because in essence, there's a sense of giving up. Also, there's a difference in locking yourself away for some me time and to recharge your batteries. I do this all the time because I love my own company where I get to sit and spend hours or days reading and writing and creating. Yeah, sometimes I just don't like people. I don't want to do people. I just want to be with myself. However, there's those who lock themselves away in isolation to escape or hide away not wanting people to see that they're not doing too well. So what's the opposite of this look like? Well, the opposite of this is ambitiously getting out and seeking social connections and community involvement. Sounds like a big deal, doesn't it? No. And the transition, make an effort to reach out to others, build a support system and engage in social activities. What this does is give you a sense of belonging. Accept things that uh, can be different. You know, stop being resigned that they can't change because gradually engaging in social activities and building a support network, what it does is it alleviates feelings of isolation. So playing a role in bringing about new possibilities and committing yourself to engage with people in things uh, which you find interesting. Because if you find interesting and they're there, well, they find them interesting as well. If you're resigned, the antithesis of this is to become, what, ambitious. So with so many social media groups available for people these days, I believe there's no excuse to not find community which resonates. At first, it's going to be uncomfortable. But remember that most people interacting with new people in new environments at the same time are most likely as uncomfortable as you. So there's nothing to lose, really. Everyone is ambitiously taking a step forward. Also, practice being the person you want to be with people who have zero previous context of you. If it's received well, brilliant. You now have a relationship with someone who knows you as you want to be. I have it that a person needs a hobby. Everyone, man, woman and child needs a hobby and social interaction. Because if they don't, they run this risk of their mind moving towards negative vices. Retail therapy, number six, ah, the dopamine hit. This is possibly the most visible one of the lot. And why is that? Because from my observations on happiness, there are two distinctly obvious measures. Those who are in debt, yet happy because they can still afford to impulsively buy stuff, they're full of joy when purchasing whatever it is. Then discard it soon enough and then need this, this new hit of retail therapy to get the drug back into them. 
And then the second thing is uh, those um, that are miserable because they don't have the money to do so. Thinking if they only had money, they can be more happy. And yes, money can buy you happiness. I've done another video on this one. But remember how I explained that happiness is nothing more than a shallow achievement. You know what's really funny? I find this, I find this really interesting. Those who buy stuff online and then they say how it brings them happiness. And while anticipating the delivery of the item, because they're chasing happiness, they don't know how to be with the frustration or the sadness when the, the product arrives late, doesn't arrive at all, or if the wrong product arrives altogether, or if it arrives broken. So can you see how hinging happiness to such superficial measurements is a self-sabotaging trap? What's the opposite of this one look like? Well, these people, they find joy in meaningful experiences rather than material possessions. The transition, well, that's really easy, I, I think. Well, it's easy for me because I'm an experiences person. They buy me stuff because I can go out and buy whatever I want myself. Gift me an experience and it's the most joyful gift I can receive. Years ago, I saw something that read uh, somewhere on social media. I'd rather have a passport full of stamps than a wardrobe full of designer clothes. And the same goes for luxury cars and a massive house and all that kind of stuff. Those words resonated so much that I lived it as a principle. Now, I remember back in 2018 when I was caught up with believing I would be happy if only I had more stuff. At the same time, I was realizing how much unhappiness all this stuff brought me because I never used it. So what I did was create this, uh, this impulse buying rule for myself. I realized that my drawers and my house and, and, and my office, it was all full of crap that I never used and I didn't need, some of it brand new. So what I started to do was give it all away. I then told myself that if I wanted anything that was worth over $200, unless it was essential of course, I had to wait 30 days before purchasing it. And then in that time, I would research about the product to see if it was a match. Two things happened in that 30 days. Number one, I realized how stupid it was that I wanted this particular thing and I forgot about it in a few days. I saved so much money doing this. The second thing that happened is that in my research and my learning and in my patience, I realized that the particular thing wasn't the thing I needed but I did need something like it. So I found something better. It wasn't an impulsive purchase. It was more something uh, that was suited to my needs. So another thing that works for me is focusing on hobbies, as I spoke about earlier. They offer an experience and every experience offers a new learning and every new learning offers a new way of being. But just be mindful not to trap yourself because many hobbies can lead to impulsive purchases. I learned this very expensively in my many years as a fisherman. Now, my biggest go-to these days is personal growth. It can easily shift the source of happiness from material to experiential because what it does, for me, it evokes great conversations with like-minded people. I could be sitting there in my pyjamas and having a deep, wonderful conversation about life and, and what it is to be human and how we go about navigating through the, the, the breakdowns in life and what bullshit stories are in the way of us achieving the things we want to achieve. All this great stuff, the things which enrich oneself and brings fulfillment, unlike a $200 pair of Versace underwear. So experiences always trump stuff. So go out and experience things. It will give you something to talk about when meeting new people and sharing what you have learnt about life. The last one, what have we got? Number seven, frequent dist uh, distractions. Guilty. So this one's a biggie for me because bright, shiny objects were like my very own Las Vegas. They meant excitement, drama, adventure, fun, chaos, all of these things which drive me. But remember, there's a polarity to everything. So often they would give me a hangover of overwhelm, fatigue and uncertainty. So what's the opposite to this? And this one was a difficult one for me to learn. It is to maintain focus and to be present in the current task at hand. And the transition, what I learned was 
Uh, removing notifications from all of my devices was the biggest help for me. It was difficult, but it was great. I even took emails off my phone years ago and follow a really tight time frame for when I do look at them. Uh, one minute of checking your phone turns into an hour of scrolling. Years ago, I read some random study that it takes seven to 15 minutes to regain focus once it's lost. So think about it. Every time you get distracted, a ping on your phone, a colleague starting a conversation, a friend calling in to talk about the weekend, it takes seven to 15 minutes to regain the focus that was lost. So if that was true, and I like to believe it because it motivates me, how focused are people really? Because for most of my life, I argued that multitasking was, was this great skill of mine. But when I understood that working on one thing at a time, uh, what it did, it removed all the anxiety and I understood differently. Because sometimes we believe it's just not feasible. Like when I had my construction company and a massive team, the phone didn't stop from 5 a.m. through till 6, 7 p.m. And in that time, I also had countless things which needed immediate and urgent attention. But when I got over my superhero syndrome and my bullshit which I attached to it, I realized that I had a team which I could leverage to do almost everything I was doing. And these days, it's even easier. These days, we've got VAs out there that can do the things uh, very cheap. There's AI tools and so many other tech products which can be leveraged so you can give your time to where it's needed, one thing at a time. They may have to complete one thing at a time, but you're working on one thing at a time. So by practicing this, I went from bright, shiny objects being a distraction to bright, shiny objects being there to attract me, not blind, uh, blind me or even blindside me. Put simple systems in place. You've got the Pomodoro technique. There's heaps of things. Ones you know which you can follow and then reward yourself for following them. That's very important. Because over time, what you do is you stretch out the systems and you increase your rewards. Because at the very least, do this and it's going to make you happy. So there you have it. They're the seven things, the seven behaviors people who are deeply unhappy exhibit along with the opposite behavior. And then uh, the transition, what can be done to transition into the opposite behavior. So I'm someone who works in the field of ontology and I've used some of the frameworks and explanations within this video. What is an ontological explanation? Well, in this particular context, it's transitioning from a state of unhappiness to fulfillment and involves this holistic change in one's approach to life. Now, this includes things like developing self-awareness, expressing one's concerns, understanding and addressing personal needs and altering habitual responses to challenges. It often requires a shift in one's frame of mind from external to internal sources of happiness, focusing on self-growth and building healthy relationships. Practices like mindfulness and goal setting and positive self-talk can facilitate this transition, not in a wishy-washy kind of way, in a real deep kind of way. It's a journey of not just changing behaviors, but also transforming one's perspective and values towards a more fulfilling and purpose-driven life. Like I, I often say, values become our terms and conditions. Understand them and we can guide through a lot of these issues. Instead of chasing happiness, these people, they, they live for something bigger. Instead of becoming resentful when they're wrong, they accept things and then they, uh, they, they, they come to peace with them. And instead of being resigned when not achieving their possibilities, they find ways to get ambitious and learn what they need to learn to propel them forward. And instead of getting anxious and withdrawing from life's uncertainties, they develop a mood of wonder and start getting curious about themselves and about life and how they can interpret things differently. Because once you do this, and you realize that happiness is nothing more than a trap, a trap which envelopes you into unhappiness, uh, you realize this and you be start becoming aware of the frameworks and you graduate from happiness to fulfillment. Fulfillment is embodying everything and then just being okay with it. So that's the end of the video. As usual, take what you will.